a good time when you hear that tune coming because it means, oh boy, there is another episode of the Rec Poker Podcast coming up. This is the Forums Edition. I'm your host, Jim Reed, Bluff Starini in the home game. If you want to find out more about me and the rest of the crew, you can go to rec.poker slash crew. Um, but I also want to thank our sponsors, the Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack and Casino, and website AMP. And I want to thank all our members, all our amazing members uh, who post these awesome hands and spots in the forum. They get involved in Discord on our YouTube channel. Uh, they come hang out in the podcast. There's tons of ways to get involved with Rec, rec Poker. Just head on over to rec.poker. Uh, and get yourself a free account. All it takes is an email address and a smile, but they are both mandatory. And you can come and uh, join the group here, uh, learn about poker, play poker, uh, belong in this group of poker players who love the game and love sharing their love of the game with each other and the rest of the world. So that's what we're doing. Um, I am just one uh, panelist here. I, I host the show, but everyone else does all the other hard work. Um, these are all other members of the Wrecking Crew, and uh, we invite our premium members to come join us on the podcast as well. So Wrecking Crew members, please introduce yourselves. I'm Rob Washam, and I'm Rabman50, just about everywhere. I'm Taylor Moss. Uh, in the home game, I'm Gopherboy TJM, And on Twitter, you can find me at Taylor underscore Moss. And so it's Monday night. We're uh, stealing each other's chips in the nightly home game. Poor John Somsky. He runs 10 play money home games a month. Uh, only one of them's on Monday night, but we're here trying to steal each other's chips. The other thing we do every Monday night uh, is we take a forum post from the free forums here at Rec Poker and talk about it on the air. Um, so this one, we actually spoke last week uh, about uh, a post from 7 High 11. We had so much fun. We're going to talk about another post from 7 High 11, our friend John. And this one's about finding the right bluffs. So we're going to talk a little bit about sort of the science of bluffing, the theory of bluffing, why to bluff, why not to bluff, when. Um, but there was some really good so I encourage, we'll go over a lot of this on the air, but I really encourage folks to go check out the forum posts um, themselves because we can't get into the same kind of detail here on the show that you can getting it all laid out there. There's some really great responses here. Um, one by Elvita, uh, my man here, Joe, who's a premium member who's joining us in the conversation today. Um, and then uh, Rob himself has put in one here. And it's just, I really encourage folks to go and check out the forums and uh, post a question themselves and uh, get involved here is a great way to do it for free and to get better at poker. So we're talking about bluffing. Um, it's something that I think a lot of recreational players like us can kind of be uncomfortable with in real time at the tables, particularly live. Uh, I think when we're sitting there at a live table, there's an element for most of us as we're learning poker, we don't wanna feel stupid or look dumb or make a mistake. And um, you know, when you, have to table a hand that was a bluff it it sort of you know it, it feels like oh i tried to do this and it didn't work and now i lost now i have to show this hand and it, you know there's like a bit of a negative experience there i think for people as they're as they're getting comfortable with the concept of bluffing um and then of course it's only made worse when when other people at the table are not being uh, welcoming or, or appreciative of your your poker journey as stupid as it is for them to do that, the world is full of idiots. So there's nothing we can do, unfortunately. Um, so I guess let's talk a little bit first about just kind of the experience, that experience and um, how, how that feels as a recreational player and what we can do uh, to make that easier on ourselves and for other players at the same table. So Joe, you had a great response here um, because John is talking about the situation that got that happened at the table tried to tried this bluff the bluff didn't work and then he felt like the person who he was talking to at the table sort of didn't make him feel any better about it uh as a consequence joe you've you've, you've had some coaching from some great players and i know you've talked about this before but like what what what's going through our minds at, at that point and and how you know, why does this feel, why does this feel bad? And what can we do about that? Well, I, you know, I think that, you know, embarrassment plays a, a huge role in terms of what prevents people from playing their best and understanding really how to play poker well. Um, and, uh, you know, the concept that I think that fits closest to home is shame. Like we're, we're ashamed of, of what we did. Uh, and I, you know, I have had the 
you know, the benefit of having uh, Doug Hall be one of my coaches uh, over the years. And he talks about tabling your bluffs proudly, learning how to be proud of this part of your game because it is a part of the game, just being aggressive. And, and you, if everybody simply waits for hands to come in, um, then we're just exchanging money around the table. So eventually you have to win hands that you're not supposed to. And a part of that is bluffing. And if you're a good bluffer, you're gonna get caught sometimes. So be proud that you're in that group of people who is able to do that um, at times um, and learn to, you know, it, it was something that I said in the post, but uh, learn to not take the, the shameful comments from the people around who just called your bluff successfully because they got lucky and it was probably difficult for them. So you, you're just trying to avoid that shame. And once you can do that, you can bluff more frequently and you win more pots that you don't deserve. Yes. And that's the key, right? Because like, like I think you were just saying earlier, if we all only win the pots that we deserve, we just trade chips around because everyone gets dealt the, the good hands at the same frequency as, the, as everyone else. And we just keep paying rake every pot. The casinos get rich and we all <laughs> just trade our chips around. No one really makes any money. The key to poker is winning hands that you don't deserve to win. Winning hands that other people are going to lose, uh, non-reciprocal wins. That's the only way to actually make money in poker. And so you have to win when you don't have the best hand. And the only way to do that is for other players to fold. That's, that's the only way. Um, so, yeah, and I, I, it's a good point to talk about, like, <clears throat> what do you do in this situation? You bluff, you get called, now what? Because, you know, there's other situations where you can... Uh, you, uh, you've got it type of thing, you know, say something. And if anyone ever says that to me, I just sit there and make them like show the cards. I, cause a lot of people, what they want to do in that situation is that go, ah, you got it. I missed. And then you show your cards. They clearly lost. Now they can mock comfortably. Um, the reverse of it, you can put them in that kind of somewhat awkward situation of, okay, it, do I have to show my cards? Like there's definitely situations where you bluff, you get called and you know, you lost. If you know that for sure, feel free to just muck your hand. Uh, but then there's the other situations where you could do that same thing and flip over your hand confidently. And it causes shock in your opponent, in your opponent for a bit there. Uh, and then it also, you know, can play out in your fact, in your benefit later as well, because, uh, they may not understand why did you take this bluff with this spot? Are you just like randomly, you know, spouting out bluffs when you think I'm going to fold uh, in certain spots? Like, do you like some better players may think about card combinations that you have, but you can put that like thought in their head that they're just a bluffer and it can open yourself up to value bet them later. Uh, whereas I think some of the situations where if you kind of like, oh, I don't know, and then just kind of like slowly muck it to the side, um, they may not think that. But if you table a, a, you know, a four high hand and you show them that it showed on, they can sometimes get thrown off by it and be like, oh man, this guy's crazy. Uh, so it, it can work out. And honestly, just don't care about what people think about you, but understand what they think about you because that is a huge part of this game is to understand what they might be thinking about you in certain spots and understand how you can take advantage of that later so i don't care what people say about me but i do care what people think about me because i'm going to try and use that to my advantage good point rob well a couple of adages um if you're never caught bluffing you're not bluffing enough <laughs> yes <laughs> um but I think what Taylor said is, is spot on. The thing, thing about bluffing is, you know, you could tell a very good story. And typically when you're bluffing, you're pinpointing a certain part of a, an opponent's range. That doesn't mean he doesn't have a different part of his range. So if, if, he, if his range happens, you know, he happens to be in the upper part of his range, you're not necessarily going to be able to bluff him. But that bluff might be perfectly fine in the range that you're targeting. So you shouldn't be ashamed of the fact that he happened to be in a different part of his range when you are trying to bluff. Because how often have you bluffed somebody when they're holding the nuts? And you just kind of shake your head and go, oh, man, I didn't think he had that. 
<laughs> Obviously, if you knew he had that, you wouldn't be bluffing. So you can't be ashamed of showing a bluff, even though it, it looks almost totally ridiculous because the guy's sitting there with the nuts. That's a great point, Rob. And I think, you know, one thing we'll talk about a bit today is like what ranges to target with your bluffs or what kind of players to target with your bluffs. Typically, you're going to want to be targeting weak ranges, ranges where the action and the and the board have gone in such a way that it's just not as likely that they have a particularly strong hand compared to the number of combos of weaker hands that they have. But as Rob points out, that's a whole range of hands. And they're in they're allowed to have the good hands too in that range. It's just that we think it's much more likely that they have a weaker hand. So that range makes an excellent candidate to bluff against. Um, but yeah, they're still gonna have it sometimes. Um so that's one thing, that's one thing we can talk about a little bit here is like bluff targeting. Uh, because A, just to, to take off on a point that Joe said earlier here, don't don't worry about looking stupid. Oh, for God's sake. No one has ever evolved the thought of poker without looking stupid to people who didn't know what they were doing. And 10 years ago, people limping looked stupid and people making small raises looked stupid. Um, and now those are at the very cutting edge of, of poker strategy, limping in the right spots, smaller raises in the right situations, knowing what makes it a good decision and not a bad decision. So um, don't be, don't at all be afraid uh, to look stupid for one thing, but just right off, forget that. Um, and, and yeah, but I mean, one thing, one way <laughs> we, we feel stupid when we do that bluff and they turn over the nuts, but again, you, you can't control where they are in their distribution of hands. You can just control what the range that you put them on was. And so that, that's a big part of it. And so the more advanced you get as a player, the easier it's going to be for you to, uh, range players to just sort of subconsciously know that they're in a weak spot. Um, but that is an art that comes with playing a lot. And in the meantime, you have to kind of rely on other ways to choose when to bluff and when not to bluff. So other than just sort of like knowing when they're weak <laughs> by using our Jedi powers, um, do you guys have any rules or, or guides or factors that you think about when you're considering whether to bluff uh, or whether not to bluff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the one thing that I always try and think of is like, how am I going to want to react on turns and rivers and uh, those types of situations where <clears throat> the board is going to change in some sort of way? And am I, am I going to be comfortable continuing on with this bluff uh, under different scenarios? So like, I think the example in this hand is kind of a tough one. It's a uh, king five five board and you think about like what turn cards come and it's like man there's not a whole lot of turn cards that come in this situation that um are gonna make some of my hands want to continue bluffing uh because you know everything like queen and lower essentially like doesn't really change what the hand like the best hand is it's like a five is you know the premier a king is pretty good but then anything else that comes out would be you know a second tier to what would come out here but that means now when you're bluffing you're kind of representing that king or potentially the five and hoping your opponent doesn't have it and on a lot of those cards you're gonna have to continue uh with the second barrel on the turn so you, you got to think through those types of situations if the turn comes an ace well then you know maybe you can you know let up and not continue on uh but you got to think about like how do those next types of hands or next types of cards that come out on future streets influence how my perceived range is going to want to attack. So in this situation, if we go for a check raise on a king five five board, my mind goes, well, we're firing every turn. And then if they're not given up by the turn, do I give up and fire again on the river or just give up and let them win the hand? And those are like the things that you have to think about before you decide should I be taking this bluff spot? Because um, there's definitely other situations where you can kind of find different spots and go, okay, hey, there's a ton of turn cards that come out here that could help my specific hand. 
And then you go, okay, well, I'm going to fire on everyone that helps my hand in some sort of way. And I'm just going to give up on all the ones that don't help me in other ways. And you just kind of use that as the, the determining play. And sometimes when you have a lot of those outs that can increase your equity, um, then it makes a good check raising spot. Yeah, Joe. Well, I, and I, I think in, in the posting, um, uh, seven high 11 talked about a spot to bluff. And I think that what Taylor was saying made me think about, well, you have to have a plan to bluff. Mm. You have to plan what you're doing going forward. And if it's not part of a plan, you're just kind of particularly in, if you only have 30 seconds to make a decision, you can't really think through all those things. So if you're going to take a line that's going to bluff, you should have a plan for whatever you're going to do across the streets. Yeah, totally agree. And um, Chris Jones, we did a rec poker seminar, one of our deep dive seminars last year, just on bluffing. Um, and the one thing that uh, Chris, <clears throat> the one thing that Chris was really hammering in, your your story needs to make sense. It needs to make sense across multiple streets, across multiple actions. It it you can't listen. You can have a one and done bluff, but it it's. If it doesn't work, then you have to think about, okay, so like, what are we going to do later? And how has our opponent's range changed by the action that's happened? Now that now the bluff hasn't worked. So they've obviously, their range is much stronger than it was before you bluffed because they fold all the hands that you wanted them to fold. Um, so having a plan, being realistic about how people's ranges are going to uh, react and having your story make sense. That is a crucial thing that... Um, you have to kind of have that bigger picture view on the hand to do. And that, that does take some time. Rob. I'm just going to say when you're planning to bluff, it's very important to choose the right opponent to bluff against, mm. because there are certain opponents that won't recognize that you are making <laughs> a bet with the type of hand that they should be folding. Yep. And it, <laughs> So the, the opponent has to be thinking enough to understand that they could be beat at this moment in time and they need to fold. And I loved what Taylor said about having plans for future streets. The primary best place to bluff is obviously the river because things yes. can't change there. You know, you, it's very, very polarized or condensed. You know, we're right there in that very polarized range or condensed range. So the condensed guy is, you know, he's got the bluff catcher and the polarized guy has got, he can bluff or he has the nuts. So that's pri primary. But if you're planning a bluff on the flop, you need to understand what are you going to do if he calls? Are you going to give up then? Um, then it's, and it's about range. Where's your range compared to their range? Is it a single raise pot? You're in the big blind versus an in position player, the standard, you know, those types of things come into play. Now, in this particular case, it was a three bet pot. I think it makes it a little more difficult to bluff in those situations, especially when he just calls on the flop. And that's where I think the bluff went wrong is prior to attempting the bluff. The story wasn't there to say that he had the hand that he was portraying. Mm -hmm. And then uh, to a point that you were just kind of talking about, Rob, like it's totally fine for your plan on a bluff to be one and done. Uh, and like, it's totally fine. I feel like a lot of people get into the situation where they're like, hey, this King 5-5 five five board, there's not a whole lot that connects that well with my opponent's range, right? Like maybe they have ace high, but I should be able to get ace high to fold. And, you know, those types of situations. So they take something and they check raise and then their opponent calls. And I feel like a lot of people get into those situations that are like, okay, well, let's go again, you know, fire the turn now. And like, they're thinking just that one step ahead of them, but like, it's totally fine for you to identify that situation go king five, five board. Uh, definitely one that can favor me and definitely one that I can check raise here, but it can also be just one where you go, I'm going to check raise flop. And if nothing happens, check turn, check river. And, uh, Hey, I took my shot and now I'm done. Uh, so it's totally fine to be in those types of situations where your plan is one and done. It doesn't have to be. My plan is to triple barrel here, uh, on turn and river as well. So, um, 
bluffs can be whatever you need them to be. Yeah, Joe, did you have something there? Yeah, okay, no, so I, I, I just real quickly is I'm sorry. No, no that's okay, yeah. okay. It just that uh, I mean Taylor kind of summed up one of the light bulb moments of my career is that it was like, oh, so a bluff. If I bet on one street without the best hand, that is a bluff in and of itself. You don't have to take air all the way to the river as a bluff in order for it to be a bluff. And as I say it now, I'm like, well, duh. I mean, you know, but that only kind of came later on to understand what a bluff really meant. Well, and we get to this point on the turn of the river where we're like, well, I have to bluff now because it's my only way to win the hand. And it's like, well, yeah, if winning every hand was the goal, then yes, it, I could see an argument for bluffing. But like we talked about in our episode last week, you're not going to win all the hands. <laughs> you're going to lose some hands. The key is in the hands that you're going to lose, losing as few chips as possible. In the hands that you can win, winning as many as possible. Um, and, and we get, we get kind of handcuffed to this idea. It's like, well, I tried this bluff and it didn't work. But I, now look at all those chips in the middle of the pot. And I bet if I bluffed again, he could fold. And it's like, well, but you're, you're not you're not thinking about the the hands that are currently in that player's range. Let the action inform your decisions. And um, and you know that like that example that uh, Taylor used on the king five five flop. What made it a good spot to bluff is that your opponent does not have a lot of combos that they can continue with. When they do continue. It just doesn't make sense to keep bluffing. It's not a good situation um, to, to have a multi-street bluff there. Other, you might also think like some players, if they know they're going to bluff the turn, if they're going to double barrel and bluff the flop and the turn, often they'll sort of like size down the flop bluff a bit, uh, the size, and then increase the size of the turn. So now when, they, when you do fold on the turn, they've won more chips from you. And they've also, you know, um, told that story that's consistent along the way. You might choose a larger sizing on the flop if you're thinking like, okay, well, this is a one and done for me. I just really want to make sure they fold the parts of their range that they're going to fold. And if they don't, I know they have a strong hand and I can continue um, with that knowledge. So like one good example, I'll just throw out there. Ace five suit is my favorite hand of all time. Um, It's a great candidate for bluffing pre-flop because it's got blocker value, it's got playability, um, all the things that we're gonna go into shortly, but that make good candidates for bluffing. But if I if I three bet uh, bluff with ace five of hearts, let's say on the button, and the flop comes, you know, eight, nine, 10 clubs, uh, and we got three callers, and we're now four ways on this flop, I'm not gonna continue bluffing. It, it's probably my only way to win the hand, as we say, but it, the, the goal for the three bet bluff it, with ace five suited was to get folds preflop. And because it didn't do that, um, I'm not obligated to keep, to keep betting with it. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about blockers and semi bluffs and, and that kind of thing. So uh, one of the reasons you might choose ace five suited, again, just preflop is because it's got blockers. So what are blockers? Blockers are anything that in your hand makes it less likely that your opponent has a value hand. So just hands with aces and kings in them. If you have a hand that has an ace or a king in it, it's just mathematically significantly less likely that your opponent has an ace or a king in their hand. So from that point of view, having an ace in your hand makes it a good bluffing candidate, like a good three bet candidate preflop. Unfortunately, the other way of saying blocker is saying bad kicker. Um, Cause if you're blocking all the hands that your opponent has an ACE, but they still do have an ACE because like I said, it just makes it less likely. They're still gonna have ACEs sometimes. Um, usually they're playing a value hand and you're playing ACE five. So they've got ACE king, ACE queen, ACE jack. The nice thing is that you block the likelihood that they have those hands. The bad news is when they do, you're dominated. Um, so, Again, when they don't fold, you actually like that. If you flop an ace, that's actually not really as, as good for you as, as you might think it is necessarily because they're going to continue with a lot of those stronger aces. So what's nice about ace five suited is that you can also flop a flush draw. And then when they continue and you get to the flop, even though your bluff didn't work, now you can make a flush draw, you can make the wheel straight draw. Um, 
you you've you've got other ways to win the hand even though your bluff didn't work and so that's like playability or equity when called which is another thing that we talk about um and in some cases you know you might choose to call in position with a hand that has really good equity and wants to see a flop but in some cases against certain opponents you might choose to make that into a three bet bluff instead because maybe it's not quite as good a hand or maybe they're just someone that's going to overfold to three bets. And when it doesn't work on the flop, you're going to have a hand that connects with flops pretty well. Um, so that's kind of like blockers, playability, semi bluffs. You know, that's why ace five suited is like a semi bluff, seven eight suited is like a semi bluff. Um, that's just talking pre flop. We can get into some of the flop stuff too. Rob? Well, talking about some of the flop stuff, you. Uh definitely have some opportunities based on the flop and your range versus your opponent's range. So for instance, if you called from the big blind, let's say you called with a Jack 10 suited, it's a pretty good hand. Um, knowing that your opponent probably raised under the gun with something like ace, king, ace, queen, ace, jack, something big. And the flop comes four, four, five. Um, it's definitely a flop that favors you. So if there's a bet, you could bet, uh, you could check call the flop. And then if the turn comes like a, a card, like a three or a six, some small little card, you could go ahead, bet out there and get a lot of folds. Yeah. And that's where you're taking your, your hand is actually totally air. You're not blocking anything. You're not blocking any of his hands. You're not, but the fact that you're sitting there in the big blind with a range that smashes that flop compared to what his perceived range is, you can make a lot of uh, interesting moves there. And again, this is a one and done. You know, you could go ahead and bet out on the turn and get a lot of folds. And if he doesn't fold, well, maybe he's got pocket kings and he's not folding anyway. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> just, just be done with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So range, range versus range is some other opportunities where you can make a bluff. Yeah, great point. Yeah, and then the other thing about that example that you just put out there, Rob, too, is if we think about blockers, which blockers are kind of, you know, extra excuses uh, to start playing hands in specific ways, but, like, the one that you laid out actually has, like, what I would think is some pretty good blocker value. Like, you having a jack in your hand and you having a 10 in your hand blocks them from potentially having pocket jacks, pocket tens, which... Again, it's a small thing, but you know all the small things add up. And if we think about an under the gun range, it's probably pretty tight. It's probably you know the best pocket pairs, and then you know your ace kings, your ace queens, and then if it's a tight opponent, maybe not even ace jack uh, and stuff like that. So when you get that type of run out, like when you're betting, I'm guessing jacks and tens are calling, but you block them, so you make it a little bit less likely. The hands that they're gonna fold the ace kings, the ace queens, you don't block those. So you actually like slightly increase the odds that when you think about their tight range, you're actually increasing the likelihood they have the part of the range that they're going to fold and decreasing the likelihood that they have the part of the range that they're actually going to call. So it that exact hand actually has some really good uh, blocker benefits uh, when we break it down. So that's another thing to think of. And it's, it, it's a small thing, but hey, I'm, I'm playing poker and I'm getting into situations where, you know, I'll take a, a flip with where I have, you know, 51% equity versus a 49% equity spot or 52. Like those tiny percents can add up, especially if you're playing a lot and kind of looking at numbers in the long run. Totally. Uh, Joe, anything from you there? Yeah, I, I think that um, Taylor's pointing out one of the things that when I started using blockers as an idea of when I could bluff, um, you know, it was easiest when it was flushes, right? Because everybody fears the flush and everybody knows how many hands, but if you have the ace of spades or if you have the king of spades and, uh, on a, and you're bluffing, um, or, and, and you're bluffing, then, then you can have an idea of what you may be blocking from somebody else having and make some predictions about how they may, what they may be worried about, which will cause them to fold more frequently. Yeah, that's a great example that, especially when it comes to having the nut flush blocker, that's just a great example of how if there's 
let's just say, let's just say there's four hearts on the board and you've got the ace of well okay bad example there's three hearts on the board <laughs> and you've got the ace of hearts so you don't have another heart in your hand so you don't have a made flesh but what you do have is the absolute concrete knowledge that your opponent does not have the highest possible flesh on the board they do not have the nut flesh so you can you can pretend that you have the nut flesh in a way <laughs> that is extremely you know like that that the fact that you know they don't have it um that that makes a big difference that makes a big difference that makes this a much more enticing spot to put that bluff out there against the right opponent um because yeah. they're gonna have to feel that pressure yeah taylor yeah and like think about it like let's take Rob's example and like flip it again. You know, you're playing against someone from early position and you've got the ace of hearts on a board. That's got three hearts out there. And let's say even one of those hearts is like the king of hearts. Mm. That's another like blocker effect. It's not in your hand, but it's on the board. Now you got to think, okay, well, I've got the ace of hearts. The king of hearts is out there. They're in early position. What suited hands are they playing from early position that could potentially have the flush here? And it's like, okay, well, you know, the suited aces, maybe they have ace queen, ace jack. No, no, no. You've got the ace of hearts. Now they don't have that. Well, okay, maybe king, queen, king, jack. No, no, no. That's on the board. Now they don't have any of those. And you go, okay, well, how many flushes do they actually have here? It's uh, incredibly small. Uh, and they're going to have to be fearful of it. So you, you go into a situation where you're like, I know you don't have a flush. And that's the scary thing on the board right now. Great bluff opportunity. And this is one of those spots where you need to win hands where you don't have the best hand. And so if you, if all you have is the ace of hearts on a three heart board, but they've got top pair and you win the hand, that is how you make money at poker. Okay. So you got to find these spots where you can make them fold the better, the best hand. And you got to target those uh, when they have a range that can fold enough. Um, when you have the right cards in your hand, when it's against an opponent who understands how to find the fold button, which is not a given. <laughs> and, um, and then, and then again, you know, when you know if this is a one and done frequency play, like they just don't have it here very often, or whether it's, I'm going to take advantage of this on a future street, depending on what cards come um, and that kind of thing and how the board's board plays out. So you can give yourself a lot of advantages there. Um, Another couple things I just want to hit quickly. Uh, what are other good spots for bluffs? So anytime you've sat at the table and you said to yourself, oh man, he always has it here. That's a great spot for a bluff. Anytime you're thinking, oh, he's always got it. So try and reverse engineer that spot and figure out how you could put yourself in that same position, but with a different hand. Because most of the hands we play don't go down to showdown. So it actually, most of the time, guys, it doesn't really matter what your cards are. I hate to break it to you. <laughs> so um, so often, and especially in spots like this, where it's like, oh, he's always got it. The reason we think he's always got it is because he took some bet, he took some betting lines and the board ran out a certain way. That's it. So if you can find boards like that, predict you know spots like that where you can instead take those same betting lines but with different hands then you're just gonna you're gonna put the bluff out there they're gonna say this guy's always got it they're gonna insta muck and and move on so and vice versa anytime you think to yourself oh man this guy's always bluffing here great spot for a really big value bet right like if you actually have the nuts there so it's gonna be hard to do because usually the guy's always bluffing there but what is it about that spot that makes it so that makes players so uh, unbalanced weak in that place? Retro, retro uh, fit a strong hand into that spot. And that's, that's now a great bluffing opportunity um, or a great value betting opportunity. So that's one thing I would say, always just try and be on the other side of that. And at the more you play, the more you'll find these spots where it's like, Oh, I always have it here, but I don't actually have it this time. So that makes this a good time to bluff, um, which is the same kind of thing that we're talking about here. The cards are, you know, in a way they actually don't really matter that much. Um, and then the only other thing I would say is that another good time to bluff in a vacuum, again, these are all just different factors. They all kind of work together. But 
anytime the nuts change, you've probably heard this expression before. If, uh, if the board pairs on the turn, that's a good time to make a, a bluff because you could have like friends, perfect time. So let's say you call from the big blind. I won't, it doesn't even matter what your cards are. You call from the big blind, the flop comes king, 10, four. Uh, you check in position player bets, you call. Turn comes a four or turn comes a 10. That's a good spot for you to be bluffing because on the previous street, you know, uh, pair of kings was, uh, was going to be the strongest hand. Now, when the board pairs, um, it's a way that favors you a lot more. We could actually, you know what, guys, let's find a better example than that, where the actual nuts change, because that's not really a good example. Let's say that there's uh, like six, seven, eight rainbow, and a lot of betting goes in on six, seven, eight rainbow. Then the nuts at that point is a straight. And the person that has the straight is the one who should be doing all the aggressive betting. Now let's say the river turns and a full house is possible that wasn't possible before. What I'm getting at is the player who had the straight no longer feels confident in the strength of their hand. So they had the nuts, they were putting a lot of money in, they felt great about it. Now the board's paired, their straight might be no good. And you would have played a set strong as well on that previous street. So the nuts have changed, your opponent's feeling uncomfortable, that's another good time uh, to bluff. Anytime the nuts change, because uh, that person that was feeling very comfortable putting money in before now should feel less comfortable. Um, I didn't do a great job of <laughs> proving that through examples, but trust me, that one's true. Yeah, Rob? Well, even, even your first example was okay. I mean, what if the guy's sitting there with ace king, you called right. in the big blind, he raised, you called. Now you checked, he bet, he's got top pair, top kicker. And you called and a 10 shows up on the turn. Mm -hmm. What did you call his flop bet with? A lot of tens. There's because he's he's got the ace king. I mean, he's blocking everything else that has, you know, he's blocking all the kings. So he's not putting you on a king, he's putting you on a 10. Right. So the minute that 10 shows up, that that is an opportunity to bluff a thinking player. Yep. Yeah. The, the John's, <clears throat> excuse me, the John Samsky uh, thing that I keep hearing in my head is like, Hey, when did the, the other draw oh, come yeah. in or the other thing that you're representing or could be representing come in. So even in like this example where the 10 comes in, let's say you had queen Jack, you had the open-ended straight draw, like the 10 comes out, that doesn't help you at all. But like, what other hands are you calling with in that spot? You're calling with the queen Jack, but you're also calling with, you know, the, ace 10 the jack 10 the stuff that now hits trips and now you can start betting that and kind of going through that situation or to try and recreate some of the examples that you're trying to go through like let's say you know there's a flush draw out there and then the straight comes in on the river or vice versa there's a straight draw out there and then the flush comes in on the river and you've got the one that didn't come in Good bluff opportunity you played it the same way as a draw your opponent was hopefully not on that draw uh we're playing some sort of value hand it's a good opportunity for you to then turn your missed value into a bluff yep absolutely i love that i love that somskyism that guy's so sharp so you should buy him a beer someone should buy that guy a beer and then email <laughs> me a photo of them buying him a beer so that i can buy them a beer in las vegas when i go down there this june and july great idea taylor you're right <laughs> you're right <laughs> um all right well i think we we talked about bluffing a lot there um i don't know if we even quite technically answered john's question from the forum post but um is there anything else that we should is there anything else that we should talk about here gang before we roll on out of here all right well i want to thank uh joe uh, our premium member for joining us in the conversation here i wish more premium members would come and talk poker with us on the podcast we get a few every once in a while um, but i get so sick of talking to taylor and rob and john and chris about this kind of stuff we really need to have more premium members popping in brightening our day like joe did tonight so thanks joe uh I, great input too great input man um, and of course i gotta thank seven high eleven john we got to thank our uh, Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack, and Casino. Uh, we got to thank <laughs> the website AMP. 
Uh, of course, Steve Fredland for putting this whole thing together and uh, for all he's done for Rec Poker over the years. And for you, the listeners, thank you so much, and we'll see you again soon.